Hi, and welcome to the second video in my series, Developing My Arduino FPGA Shield. Um, in this video, I'm focusing specifically on configuration of the FPGA device and what it takes to get it all connected up in such a way in which I can configure the FPGA from the SPI flash. So for those people who either didn't catch the first video or who may need a bit of a refresher, my project is stored in projects.hackaday.com. Uh, you'll find it under Arduino FPGA Shield. Um, but let me show you the top level diagram here and just give you a brief explanation. So at the center of the design is a Xilinx Spartan 6. And the Spartan 6 stores its configuration in a series of CMOS latches. What does that mean? Well, it means that it's a volatile device. So if I take power away, the FPGA loses its configuration, it has no knowledge of what its intended function is. So in this case, what I need to do is when the device is powered up, I need to program the FPGA. Now there's a number of different ways to do that, a number of different configuration options, and I'm gonna talk about those and kind of enumerate a couple of those at least. But in my case, what I've chosen to do is boot from SPI configuration flash. So when I power up the FPGA, I want it to load its configuration from SPI configuration flash. Likewise, I wanna be able to update the FPGA as it's executing in system. So basically by triggering a reboot of the FPGA alone as a standalone device, the rest of the system can continue to run, but I can redeploy hardware inside of the FPGA. And this is kind of cool because it gives me some unique capabilities or some ability to actually modify the hardware as it's running in some product or some device that I might build and deploy somewhere where I may not even have direct access to it. Now, something that's also quite cool about this, the choice of SPI configuration flash, because it's SPI, means that I can connect that flash to anything else along the SPI bus that I really want to. Obviously, I've got to arbitrate and, and do some other things there, but we'll get into all of that. Um, that means that you know, via, say, the ICSP header, which connects the SPI bus on the Arduino board up to the shield above it, I could conceivably reprogram the SPI configuration flash, then trigger the FPGA's boot sequence. And when I do that, it would load a new configuration. Now, if you think a little bit further down the road from that, you can imagine loading an FPGA configuration from something like an SD card, as an example, or loading an FPGA configuration all the way from out on the internet somewhere, downloading that file, storing it into the SPI configuration flash, rebooting my FPGA, and deploying brand new hardware as it's executing out in the system somewhere. So it's cool, it's fun, it's, it's uh, something that you can spend a lot of time kind of playing on and riffing on and having a lot of fun with. So that said, that's kind of the intended function. But before we get into too much detail on that, let me first of all say that the FPGA vendors do an extraordinary job with documentation. There is so much documentation, in fact, that it can be a little bit intimidating. Um, you know, this alone, this is an FPGA configuration guide, and it's 164 pages long. So what I'm going to try to do uh, in this video is just kind of cut through some of that, separate out all the stuff that we don't need to know, and just focus on what does it take uh, to go ahead and configure the FPGA by way of schematic. Um, in a way in which we can program this via SPI. Now, I'm focusing really on the SP, uh, excuse me, on the FPGA side of this. Later, we'll focus on the SPI flash side of this, but uh, it's really quite simple once we have this kind of nail. So that said, let me just give you a little bit of context. So FPGAs have two configuration modes, okay? One configuration mode is what's known as a master configuration mode, and another known as a slave configuration mode. Okay, now the master configuration mode and slave configuration mode are master and slave with respect to what? Well, they're with respect to the FPGA, okay? And more correctly, it's with respect to the configuration clock. So who's actually driving the configuration clock? Is the configuration clock being driven by the FPGA or is it being driven by the some other device and the FPGA is the slave. So under master configuration mode, the FPGA is driving the clock. Under slave configuration mode, the FPGA is receiving the clock and being configured by some other intelligent device. Now that could be something like a microprocessor, could also be something like a JTAG programmer, um, 
variety of other different things. Under master mode, most commonly you'll find things like SPI flash. And then you may find things like the Xilinx platform flash. Um, and there's a number of other ways to configure things, both under master and slave modes. But these are a couple of very common ones. Now, our attention is really going to be paid to SPI flash right here. So what we're going to do is look at how do we set this up, first of all, in master mode, so we can program this via SPI flash. So when the FPGA boots, the FPGA is responsible for loading its configuration from the SPI flash. If it were in slave mode, then when the device down here wanted to reprogram the FPGA, it would be responsible for driving the FPGA's programming process. Okay, so that's it. Let's jump into the documentation a bit. What we need is to get the FPGA into master serial SPI configuration mode. And the way that that's done is by way of two pins that belong to the FPGA device, pin M1 and M0. M1 being the leftmost, M0 being the rightmost. In this case, I need to set this for master serial SPI such that M1 is zero and M0 is one, okay? Taking a look at my schematic, essentially what I've done to do that here is located on my schematic symbol. And actually, let me zoom out a bit and show you my FPGA. So this is my FPGA device. Actually, all of these symbols here all represent really subparts to my single FPGA part. So this is U1A, U1B, U1C, U1D, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're all U1, but I've just broken them up into different IO banks, uh, makes it much, much easier to work with on the schematic. So in this case, I've got M0, which is one pin up here, and then I've got M1, which is another pin down here. M1, I'm pulling down. So in this case, I'm pulling that down the ground. I've got now zero on M1, and M0, I'm putting that up, or pulling that up to 3B3, so now, again, left-right sequence, zero and one matches what I have here for my master SPI, or my master serial SPI configuration mode. Now, again, clock direction is going to be output. So going back to my schematic over here, locating my clock, here's my clock. C clock is actually my configuration clock. This is gonna be in output. Uh, in an output mode. And you'll see that the pin here can actually be defined bidirectionally, but this is actually gonna be set up as an output because of what I've done with M1 and M0 here on the schematic. Now, the configuration clock has some touchiness with respect to the PCB and some things that you have to do with respect to, uh, to the board to make sure that everything works well. That's all documented in the section board layout for configuration clock. Okay, a couple of things to point out. First of all, it says route the configuration clock net as a 50 ohm controlled impedance transmission line. What does that mean? Well, for those people who don't know what impedance control is, uh, let me suggest that you Google it. It's probably not uh, good to try to unpack that in this video. However, uh, for those people who know what it is and they just wanna get to a point in which they can draw a 50 ohm track on PCB, so a track on PCB or a trace on PCB in which the width of the trace corresponds to 50 ohms controlled impedance. Um, if you need to jump out there on the internet, you can find a lot of PCB impedance calculators. Uh, just be sure that when you plug the data into those calculators, um, that the data that you're plugging into it, that you really understand the way that it's actually going to achieve that calculation because you can do it wrong, okay? That said, Another note here, it says always route C clock net without any branching, do not use a star topology. Okay, great. So, so we're not gonna split this off every which way. We're really gonna do point to point on this. The other thing here is terminate the ends of this uh, configuration clock transmission line with a parallel termination of 100 ohms to VCCO and 100 ohms to ground, okay? What does that mean? It basically means we're gonna tee this off with a 100 ohm resistor going to VCCO and a 100 ohm resistor going to ground. Definite equivalent to VCCO divided by two, okay? Assuming a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. So for those people who didn't get any of that um, and those people who, like me, always prefer a picture, 
there's a picture down below. So here's the master side. Here's the slave side. C clock output, C clock input. These little tube symbols, transmission lines. Okay. Basically, it's saying that the conductor between the output here and the input, so between my FPGA device and my SPI flash device, that conductor, the copper on PCB, needs to be Z0, that's impedance, 50 ohms. Okay. And I'm going to add a termination on this, which is 100 ohm impedance to VCCO, or sorry, 100 ohms uh, resistor to VCCO and 100 ohm resistance to ground. Okay. That is what I need to do at the board level. Capturing that at the schematic level, basically I've done exactly that. So I've taken this wire here, I've got 100 ohm resistor going up to 3V3, which is my VCCO, and then I've got a, another wire here going down to ground through my 100 ohm resistor as well. Okay, so very straightforward. Uh, nothing too special about it. With that configured, like that. The rest of this is actually relatively easy. Okay. SPI's got my two SPI signals, so my data out uh, and my data in. Again, with respect to the master in this case, so master out, slave in, master in, slave out. Those signals I'm just calling out here, those I'm going to connect directly to my SPI flash device. And we'll get into that in the next video. Um, the other thing that I have is my chip select. Now, can you guess which uh, which component is actually going to drive the chip select? Well, if the FPGA is the master, it's going to be the one that's selecting when it wants access to the SPI flash. So in this case, chip select O, the O here standing for output, indicates that this is my output, which is going to connect to the chip select pin on the SPI flash. So when I want access to the SPI flash, I need to assert the chip select on the SPI flash and say, hey, I want to talk to you. Um, and that's going to give me that over the SPI bus. Okay. A couple of other small things to pay attention to here. And later in the next video, we're going to talk about JTAG configuration. We're not going to talk about that in this video. Um, however, a couple of things that I do want to talk about, the done pin and the program pin. So basically the state machine for programming this works like this. I pull down the program pin. Okay, the program pin is active low. And I pull the program pin down. When I do that and I release it, it puts the FPGA device into configuration mode and starts configuring itself, loading from the SPI flash. So it initiates the programming process. Okay. When that process is completed, the done pin should go high. Now, a couple of things to consider with the done pin. All right. First of all, I don't want to interfere with the FPGA during the process of configuration. So in that case, I want to be sensitive to when I'm sending information at the FPGA, and I do that by sensing what's going on in the done pin. The other thing that I want to do is let other things in the system know that might be upstream. So if I attach a shield on top of this, those other things I would want to be able to connect into the done pin as well. So I know that when the FPG is in programming mode, I'm waiting for the done pin before I start going at the FPG and blasting the FPG with a bunch of information or requests or whatever. Okay. So the done pin is really going to be our measure of success. Now, there are a couple of other things to consider in terms of sort of managing uh, what is a successful programming sequence. Um, and there are lots of different ways to slice that. I'm not going to go into that in this video. Um, now, we do have an init B pin here. Um, essentially, what this is going to do is allow us to delay the configuration sequence. So we could start the programming process and delay the configuration sequence by holding this low. Um, or later in the process, this is actually going to give us a CRC, which indicates whether or not configuration has been successful. So where do you find all of that information? Well, again, going back down into the device here, or sorry, into the uh, documentation here, if I scroll down a bit, this table will give you most of the detail of that, okay? Um, this is the serial configuration interface pins and describes the function of each one of those different pins, okay? So just consider that in the process. Um, that you do have a lot of resources that are available to you in the documentation. And, it, you know, as long as you employ sort of a surgical strike, you can usually get into the documentation and find the resources that you need without having to read too much additional information that you don't really care about. So, as I indicated in the next video, I'm going to focus on a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to focus on connecting these signals into the SPI flash itself. So, we'll go ahead and complete the SPI flash schematic. Um, and then also, 
talk about JTAG configuration of the FPGA device. Just so you know, irrespective of whether or not you choose to have SPI configuration on the device or not, all FPGA devices uh, in the Spartan 6 family have JTAG configuration already there, already enabled, has nothing to do with what you choose in terms of M0 or M1 with respect to whether it's in master mode or slave mode or anything like that, JTAG always available to you in the FPGA device. So that said, I'm going to go ahead and call it quits. And in the next video, we'll talk about SPI configuration, JTAG, and a whole bunch more stuff.